This video is sponsored by Brilliant. This is the third in a series of videos about Simplex, a solid rocket motor I designed, built, and fired over the last few months. One of the most challenging parts of this project was designing and fabricating the nozzle, and that's what we're talking about today. So let's get nozzling. A rocket motor, whether it's liquid, solid, or the worst of both worlds, hybrid, needs a nozzle in order to operate. This video is not really about nozzle theory, there are lots of resources about that on the internet, but here are some basics. For any rocket motor, the goal of the nozzle is to take those hot gases inside the combustion chamber and accelerate them to a supersonic velocity, or above Mach. That's part of why we call these things here Mach diamonds. And this is like fundamentally why rockets work. We want to throw as much stuff as possible out the back of the rocket motor, and a well-designed and well-made nozzle helps us do that. Let's take a look at a cross-section here. Inside of the rocket motor, we have all of this hot gas that's at a high pressure and it's moving fairly fast. But if we've done our design correctly, that gas should be subsonic or below the speed of sound. When the gas hits the top of the nozzle, we need a converging section to guide that gas into a smaller cross-sectional area. And this will increase the velocity gas and decrease the pressure. The reason this happens is because of some guy named Daniel Bernoulli, who in the 1700s was like, uh, so if there's some gas and it's moving pretty slow and if the pressure is pretty high, I would bet that if you took that gas and started moving it faster, the pressure is probably gonna drop lower. And it's like super weird that people talked like that in the 1700s, but it's a direct quote, so what are you gonna do? Anyway, we bring these gases down to the throat of the rocket nozzle where they transition to sonic speeds, which means they're at their local speed of sound. And at this point, it's time to take these gases and expand them back out through what's called the diverging section. By having these gases diverge, we once again drop the pressure and temperature further, and as the gas is leaving, it continues speeding up, which we want. As I mentioned, you can learn lots more about nozzle theory online. There are plenty of good YouTube videos and articles on it. We're not really covering that today, but those are some basics. So let's start designing and building this thing. As for the nozzle design, throat diameter is one of the most critical dimensions we can pick in a solid rocket motor. Here in open motor, we set the diameter to 1.3 inches. This number was arrived at by trading off the pressure desired inside of the motor, as well as other characteristics like the mass flux through the throat and the port to throat ratio. Of course, if you watched the last video about mixing and casting the rocket propellant, you know that we royally borked that finisil section. So this simulation of how our rocket motor performs is probably not going to be accurate. You'll also know that we chopped off that finisil section, so we need to resize the throat anyway. Now, without the finisil, if we leave that throat size at 1.3 inches, we get a thrust curve that looks like this with a peak chamber pressure of about 606 psi, which is an all right range to be in. That said, at this point, Charlie and I were pretty convinced that there were more unseen large voids inside of the rocket motor, which would contribute to increasing the chamber pressure and increasing the burn rate of the motor, both of which are, you know, a little spooky. Our case bursting pressure is 1400 psi, but that's in the best of cases and assumes everything goes to plan. So out of an abundance of caution, I opted to open up the throat to 1.45 inches, reduce our performance, and shoot for a peak chamber pressure of 440 psi. This is fairly low, but as we're all aware at this point, the goal of Simplex isn't to build a high performance motor, it's to build a motor that doesn't blow up. And 440 gives us plenty of margin in case we hit a couple of voids in there. All right, now using on shape and looking at a cross section, I designed this nozzle out of three separate materials. We have the aluminum nozzle carrier, the phenolic nozzle insulator, and the graphite throat. To recap, the aluminum carrier provides a strong mechanical way to hold the nozzle inside of the case with those radial bolts, and it provides a smooth, non-porous surface for those O-rings to seal against. The phenolic insulator ablates away, and it protects the aluminum of the nozzle from seeing any of the hot gas, and it also protects the aluminum from seeing any of the heat from the graphite throat, which does not ablate away. It does not melt, but it is really Really, really hot. All right, so we've got our throat diameter, and now what about the angles for the converging and diverging section? Well, I picked 15 and 50. You might wonder, how do you pick these numbers? For me, it just kind of looked right. I don't know, like it's rocket science, and also at some point you gotta pick some numbers and run with them. There is actually math that goes into picking the right angles for your nozzle, but I'm not getting into it, and again, at some point you just gotta pick some numbers that look right and start building. I bought this 
thick, super fine ISO molded graphite rod that was four inches in diameter and about a foot long. I chopped off a section to start making the throat. Now, you might be wondering, why am I doing this outside? That's because graphite dust is highly abrasive, which means that if you get the dust on machines like a mill or a lathe, it can damage them over time. Graphite is also electrically conducted, so between those two things, you do not want graphite dust in your shop. That said, we gotta turn this thing on a lathe, so I took my lathe and I rolled it into my backyard and got to work turning down the outside diameter and length. I covered my lathe in wet paper towels to protect what I could, and I slurped up the rest of the dust with a shop vac. I will say, machining outside is wonderful. It is this beautiful, peaceful experience, and I want to do more of it. After turning the outside, I used a hole saw to bore out the center and got to work on the tapers. With my little eBay lathe, this meant using angle blocks to accurately set the taper angles. I did a lot of this work using a super wimpy boring bar, because at the time, I didn't have anything larger. You can also see lots of line patterns forming here, because the compound slide doesn't rotate well enough to move consistently, so I'm like twisting it the whole way incrementally. After turning down the final throat diameter, I turned the taper on the outside of the throat insert and began sanding the surfaces smooth. The final product came out looking very pretty, so now it's time to move on to those phenolic parts. We're going to start off with this lower, larger section of phenolic, and before we get started, I want to acknowledge the way that this works feels very stupid. I don't say that about a lot of things, and I'm actively trying to find better ways to make nozzle parts like this, but uh, you're about to see why. Okay, so here's the deal. We want to turn this part on a lathe, right? So ideally, we start off with a round piece of stock material, right? Wrong! You can actually buy phenolic linen rods easily online that we could make this thing out of, but the weave direction on these things is like all wrong. Linen phenolic is a composite material, which means that it has linen and then it has this phenolic resin that goes inside of it. This is a block of linen phenolic right here, and if you look closely, at the edge you can see the stacked up linen that gets then fused with phenolic and formaldehyde and resin. It's, it's really nasty stuff when you're actually making it. It's pretty safe in this form, but anyway. It's a great insulator, but you can imagine that because the linen is stacked up this way, let's say I take this comically large flathead screwdriver that I have for some weird reason, and you put it on the top of the linen phenolic and you hammer it down. It would really easily split in that direction, much more easily than it would split if you put it in the top of the weave right here. Anyway, the point of this is to say that the weave direction in a lot of these linen phenolic rods is the same as this, except that they put the rod through this way, not this way. That means that if your rocket nozzle is cut out of the weave direction this way, it's going to be really prone to splitting open instead of remaining one piece. Anyway, now you get to see how stupid it is to make this with the right weave direction. So here we go. We're going to make the phenolic insulator out of the blocks of this stuff, and I'm actually using multiple. And this is it's it's even it gets even stupider it's really easy and really cheap to buy phenolic in this form and so what i did is i used a hole saw to make these square parts round so that we didn't have to turn down as much material once it got to the lathe then i bored out the centers of these parts with a smaller hole saw for the same reason and we have to do this in multiple blocks because you don't have a hole saw that's like six inches deep so it, it has to be done in multiple sections then i epoxied all these round parts together using g5000 rocket epoxy and in theory a nozzle like this will be in compression the whole time, so even if the rock epoxy burns away just a little bit, it like should be fine. After letting these parts cure with a ton of clamping force over about 48 hours, I tossed it back on the lathe in the garage and started turning the outside diameters. Phenolic dust, much like graphite dust, is very not good to breathe in. So with basically all of this stuff, I am always wearing a respirator and safety goggles, and sometimes headphones too, because the noise of the lathe plus the shop vac gets pretty old. <laughs> For this, I'm still using that wimpy boring bar. By now I had ordered a beefy one, but it just hadn't arrived yet. Turning the inside tapers here was a tricky process since all the angles are slightly different, but after I finished the inside geometry, I went back to the outside to turn the taper to fit it inside the nozzle carrier. And after that, the part was done, so now we will do the nozzle top insulator. This part was fairly simple. First I turned the inside lip that fits over the graphite insert. As I went, I checked the dimensions against the CAD file, but most importantly, I checked the dimensions against the actual parts. When you have something like this that's a one-off 
one-off production, it's good to start out by following the CAD, but as the part builds up, it's better to follow what the part needs, because tolerance errors can sort of stack up. I then used my newer, slightly stronger boring bar to turn the top taper, and once that was all done, all of our phenolic parts are finished. Lastly, we need to turn the aluminum nozzle carrier, which started out as a real short, thick section of 6061 tubing. This was another process that I would consider to be kind of stupid. Okay. So my eBay lathe can turn up to six inches in diameter, right? N kind of wrong. It can turn like 5.9 inches on a good day. What happens if the part is bigger than that is that it will just rub against the carriage here. So bit by bit, I had to turn down the total diameter of the stock material before I could access all of the part. It's like probably time for a new lathe, but I really don't want to get one because it's really fun to see how far I can take this trashy little eBay lathe that is just like screaming and falling apart the whole time. <laughs> Anyway, as I went, I upgraded to an even beefier boring bar and started turning down the inside. I used a ton of cutting fluid for this, which did help the process, but it put lots of cutting fog into the air. And same thing here as with the phenolic, I did test fits as I went using the actual parts of the nozzle rather than staying exactly true to what the CAD said. After the inside was done, I started turning the outside of the carrier. First, the slot that the liner fits inside, and then the first o-ring groove, at which point I tossed on one of the o-rings and checked the fit with the case. So this is just with one o-ring. Yeah, okay. I think it's working. And then, after turning the second o-ring groove, I checked the fit with both o-rings. Okay. There's one. All right, second o-ring. Oh. Okay, there's one side. And then... There it is. Woo! It's in there! That's my nozzle! And honestly, it's a pretty good fit. Like, I'm... I'm feeling alright about this. I feel like it's gonna seal. Next up, it's time to put all these parts together, and we're going to do that using RTV silicone, which stands for Room Temperature Vulcanizing Silicone. This is like a very high temperature gasket maker, so it seals between the parts pretty well. First, I applied a generous amount to the phenolic insulator and the graphite insert, and then I compressed them together. Now, before I RTV the phenolic and graphite into the nozzle carrier, I need to drill out the radial bolt holes. And why do you do this, you might ask? That is a great question. It's because the holes for the radial bolts super duper duper cannot go all the way through the aluminum. The reason we want to do this is that although there's a lot of RTV on the side of that phenolic insulator and the nozzle carrier, if we put a hole between them, we allow some gas to get through if any can get through some of the RTV. So then using a 3D printed guide to position the holes, I drilled all of them out first on the motor case and then through the nozzle carrier. On the carrier, I drilled them all out with a screw collar on the bit to set the proper depth that was needed to go into the carrier, but not go too far. I also used this time to tap out the holes with M5 threads, which is the thread size for our radial bolts. Now the last step before we RTV all of these things together is to turn down the final taper on the graphite throat. I intentionally oversized the diverging taper on this graphite throat beforehand so that if the lines didn't match up well in the final nozzle, I could turn it down a little bit. So that's what I'm doing here. A smoother nozzle means you get more bang for your buck in terms of motor performance. And of course, because it's graphite, we're in the back yard outside for it. At this point, I'm like just looking for excuses to bring the lathe outside. Finally here, I coated the surface of the phenolic insulator and nozzle carrier in RTV. I let those sit out in the air for about 30 minutes to start curing a bit, then I pressed them together as hard as I could, and then, like an idiot to get more compression, I stood and danced on top of them, and then I slipped a little bit, which led to the side of the graphite throat chipping. So, you know, I probably won't do that again. I applied a generous amount of RTV on the top of the assembly and then put the phenolic insulator into place. And then I spent lots of time cleaning up the excess RTV all over the place. This stuff is kind of like epoxy. If there's a place that it can go, it probably will. And same as always with all of this stuff, when I'm working with it, I'm wearing a respirator, safety glasses, and gloves. Okay. I think we have a nozzle. Woo! And as far as nozzle things go, that's just about it. In the next video, we're going to talk about the opposite end of the rocket motor, which is the forward closure. This is the part that holds all of the pressure in at the top, but it also holds the rocket motor igniter, and it holds those pressure transducers that we can use to measure the pressure inside of the chamber. But before we get there, I'd like to thank the sponsor for today's video, which is Brilliant. 
Folks who have followed this channel for a while might already know about Brilliant. But for those who don't know, Brilliant is an online interactive platform focused on the idea of learning by doing, which is why I'm like stoked to work with them, because that's kind of my whole thing. Iterative design and building skills through actual experience is like one of the core things that I believe in, and it's a foundational thing for Brilliant as well. Brilliant is one of the best ways you can learn math and computer science interactively, and more specifically than that, Brilliant is great for building analytical skills, which is more powerful than learning specific forms formulas or equations, it's teaching you not what to think, but how to think. Brilliant offers a whole bunch of courses that you can start with today, and for me personally, I found their courses on math and specifically probability and statistics to be really interesting. If you want to try everything Brilliant has to offer, you can do that for free for a full 30 days, and you can do that by going to brilliant.org slash BPS space or clicking the link in the description down below. Also, the first 200 people who click that link will get 20% off a premium annual subscription to Brilliant, so clicking the link is a good idea. And one more time, that link is brilliant.org slash BPS space. Thanks so much to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Thank you so much to you for watching it. I am having a blast making these videos about Simplex and y'all seem to enjoy it as well. So thanks a bunch for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.